giving you uh, answer to question one. And let me give you a little advice. That's a beautiful proof. It's uh, very old. And we will go back to give it. And the theorem says, and I think most of you know that proof. But let me repeat the proof for you. And this is something which I advise you to keep in mind if people really want to know what, um, what you do as a mathematician. Because this, this really shows the intrinsic strengths of, uh, of doing that math. Well, the first step of the proof is that we know there exists at least one prime number. For example, 57. Oh, <laughs> okay, uh, 13. So there exists at least one prime number, right? And then we say, then we say, well, suppose I have a number of prime numbers. And now I construct a new one. So please take the tape in your head. Did I say prove they exist, or did I prove, did I say construct, really construct one? Right? So that's quite important. And I construct a new one, and you do it as follows. I define a number m by taking this product and I add one. Now, so you see, m is bigger than one. So here's at least one element, and that one element is at least two. So this number is uh, at least three. In any case, it's not one. That's, that's important, right? And I consider all B such as one is another one, M, and such that D divides them. And my claim is that this set is non-empty. <coughs> of course not, because this M is at least three. So D can be chosen to be equal to M. So there is at least one element in this set, and perhaps there are more. So this set is non empty. This is a set of positive numbers at most m. So that's the bounded set. And I can take the smallest element. So choose P, the smallest in this set. Those are really construction. And now you show that P prime, and you show that P does not belong to P1 And I'll leave it to you to use an exercise to prove these things. Just in word I have point of view, uh, why is it a prime? Well, suppose it would have a divisor bigger than 1. Then that divisor divides P. P is in this set divides M, so that no divisor would be in this set, but I've taken the smallest, so that's, that, that's okay. And the other is that if P is one of these, right, then you write this number as a product times that prime number, and this M it is, is not visible by the prime number, but the right hand side is not visible, so that's, that's a conclusion. Okay, so this is the way, so we see there are infinitely many prime numbers, and let me make a trivial remark for you. 
uh, review mark is um, we prove existence of infinitely many prime numbers and we really construct an infinite sequence of prime numbers but we are not computing explicitly every prime number and of course you can make this list and sometimes this number is prime, sometimes it's not the solution to start is 2 and then you see the first 3 or 4 steps I guess you get a prime number, 2 plus 1 is 3 and 2 times uh, <coughs> 3 plus 1 is 7 and 2 times 3 plus times 7 but 3, 2 plus 1 is 43 again is prime but then it starts getting bad and all of a sudden you don't get prime numbers and you get smaller numbers so we really do construct an infinite list of prime numbers but of course they have hazard they, they, sometimes the smaller one comes in sometimes the bigger one comes in and we don't compute but it is pure thought that this is done ok so we have answered question 1 and the answer is yes let me give you an answer to question 2 you want to construct two prime numbers or prove existence of two prime numbers where the gap is at least n and here's the proof you take n factorial and that part is n and f of n from not that before and I take n plus 2 and that's nice because let's suppose this is at least 2, otherwise it's not interesting. Uh, then this number is even, so n plus 2 is even. That's not a prime number. Let's consider n plus 3. If n is at least 3, then n factorial is divisible by 3, and adding 3, it's still divisible by 3. So that's not a prime number and plus 4 and this can go up until m plus m and I claim all numbers written here are not prime numbers right uh, I don't know <coughs> m plus 1 is and I don't know what m plus m plus 1 is I don't know whether it's prime or non-prime yeah in any case, I can construct EI is the biggest prime less or equal to this. Then PI plus 1 is the smallest prime big or equal to this. And now you see that PI plus 1 minus PI is bigger than M plus or equal to M minus so you see I've constructed for your eyes two prime numbers where the gap is at least n so you see it proves completely completely easy right it seems a very difficult question but I just do it and even I construct the prime numbers right I didn't say I, com I compute them because if n is large, this may be a very large number and then to, to find by hand or by machine PI that, that, that might be different. Um, question, which number do appear as difference? Let me show you 7 does not. So my claim is 
if you take two consecutive prime numbers, seven does not appear as a difference. Why? Well, many odd prime numbers are even, namely all the numbers larger than two are even excluded, so are odd. And so the difference is even. So if seven would appear <coughs> as a gap, and it would never be in between two prime numbers. And even, I can prove 7 does not appear as p prime minus p double prime. Where p prime and p double prime are two randomly chosen primes. Because if these two are odd, then the difference is even and 7 is not even. So the only possibility is that the smallest one is 2, and that the biggest one must be 9, but to get a different 7. Yes? And I have a little exercise for you. Exercise. That I give infinitely many J not appearing. as P prime. Okay, and there are, there are many ways of phrasing these problems. And the question which number numbers appear with difference, there is a famous conjecture, and it's called Polignac. And the Google is Polignac conjecture, which says that every uh, even number does appear as a difference between to consecutive And there's a very good reason for that, and I'll, I'll come to that reason. <coughs> uh, let me answer once a nice thing. Suppose I have three numbers. And the, the middle one is too bigger than the first, and the next one is too bigger than the middle one. And my claim is that the number 3 divides either 2 and, or n plus 2 or n plus 4. Can you follow my English? I gave a fast proof. Suppose dividing by 3 gives 0 as a best. So that means 3 is divisible and n plus 3. Then I'm done. Suppose dividing by 3 gives rest 1. Then 1 plus 2 is 3. So then this is divisible by 3. Suppose that dividing by 3 the rest is 2. Then 2 plus 4 is 6 and divisible by 3. So one of these numbers is, is divisible by 3. So if you have such a tripoid, at least one is, is divisible by 3. But they're all prime numbers. So 3 is the only possibility. And of course you can have 3, 5, 7. There's nothing against. <laughs> but this is the only one. So this question is a completely trivial question. It doesn't mean anything, right? But what is much more interesting is the question of triplets. And the triplet is something of the form or something of the form n plus 2, n plus 6, or n, n plus 4, n plus 6. And a prime tri triplet is a triplet in which all these three things are primes. Yeah? For example, 5, 7, 11 does the job. That's, that's, that's one example. And the conjecture is, and I'll show you the way we come to this conjecture. But there's no proof, we have no way where to start, we have absolutely zero idea. And also the conjecture is <coughs> that uh, infinitely many print. Uh, um, <coughs> Thank you.
And the fact that we're infinitely many is not that we know enough of them. I'll show you that uh, we expect that there are infinitely many perfect numbers, but we only know, I think, 42 of them now. And 42 is not a very large number. But still, we think there are infinitely many. So there are very good reasons to make these conjectures and to perform this. So, in order to come to those ideas, let me start by some period reason. And to that end, I make a very strange function. And I hope you find this a very dirty, strange, nonsensical function. I of x <coughs> counts the number of primes at to x. And x is a real number. <coughs> now, imagine this. I do it up to one and a half. There are no primes up to one and a half. 1.9, 1 that's not nothing. But all of a sudden, when x is 2, that's 1. So this. Uh, function is what they call a staircase function or a step function. And it, it is long, this is zero, and all of a sudden it's one. <coughs> then again it gets two in the next prime, then it stays two, then it gets three, and so on and so on. And if you read the paper by Zagay, Zagay, I quote his, 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 his theory in his paper. Prime numbers grow like weeds. You know what weed is. When you garden, you have all kinds of flowers you don't want. Prime numbers grow like weeds among the natural numbers, seeming to obey no other law than that of chance. So all of a sudden, prime number pops up, and then for a long time, no prime, prime number pop, pops up. Here you see that it's easy to construct a desert where no prime numbers grow, and all of a sudden again a lot of prime numbers grow, and all of a sudden you have twins, so there are two very small, it was a very small gap, and you maybe have to imagine this. I didn't make it. It's not a nice function? Well, how would I? How would you call it? <laughs> <laughs> what is no, the name? A step function. <laughs> In Chinese? Staircase function? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so what Don Sagay says, these prime numbers seem to grow wherever they want, and they obey no method of chance. And that was what Gauss was doing. Every three minutes of his <coughs> life, he was computing the number of prime numbers, just by hand. And already, when he was quite young, he gave an asymptotic formula for pi of x. And this was in Gauss. Um, <coughs> he said in 1792 or 1793, he wrote in his Tagebuch, Rimsal, this is German, <coughs> and uh, Unter, unter. Okay. So, in the margin of his computations, he wrote that if A approaches infinity, the number of prime numbers is A over 1. So, it's a theorem <coughs> that pi x is the same as x minus log x 
is the the ten base x, right? Uh, sorry, the e base. Yeah. So this is a theorem, and this is called the prime number theorem, and this is hard. This is really hard, and it's very difficult to prove. But what's easy to prove is, um, let me see that I remember. Yeah, so this is hard. Easy. I x is larger than x of log x and it's smaller than the power of 5 times the log x for and the 14 smaller And I must point out that this is really easy. And in the paper by Don Sagier, you see the easy proof which produces such kind of ideas. Right? Now, let me give you immediately an answer to uh, question 8. Is, is there a prime number with 2013 digits? And I have no idea how would they ever produce such a thing. Okay, here we go. Let me, let me find my, my data. Yeah, let's assume I choose 10 equal to 22 times 10 to the power 2007. So my index n will be this number. Right? And I'm going to compute the n. Well, that's not true. I'm not going to compute this. Because I'm not able to do. But using this formula, these, uh, these formulas, I know bounds for this. And I can easily prove that um, Pn is smaller than 1.02 times 10 to the 2012. And I can also prove that this is 1.01 times 10. Yeah. So you see, these, these equalities immediately allow you uh, to compute these numbers. So here we see that for this strange choice of n, you know that this n's prime number is at least a number which has a lot of digits, which has 230 digits, right? And where the second is at least one. And the second 
is a mode two. So this one, and so this, so this is the direction. So here we prove existence. Okay, now let me give an answer to four. And I want you to promise me that you never tell anybody the secrets I've been doing now. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a secret. And so the proof is there are far too many Fermat primes. And here's the proof. Um, the chance that the number uh, m is prime is uh, approximately 1 over log m. And that you immediately see from this prime number two. Yeah? So the number is some, uh, something like this. And if you want, you can show it's smaller than a over log m, where a is some constant. Okay, and now I <coughs> compute the number of Fermat primes. What I do, I take the chance that uh, fi is a prime number, and I sum these chances. And of course, this is at most 2 uh, a over log 2 to the 2 to the i. And then sum over i. <coughs> yeah. So that is 1 over log 2 times, uh, sorry, yeah, that is uh, 2 to the i times a over log 2. Yeah. And this is summed in kind of zero to infinity. And of course this we can sum because this is just 1 plus a half plus a quarter, so that's at most 2. So this is smaller <coughs> than 2 away from log 2. So the total number of Fermat primes is at most 2 over a over log 2. There's one little gap in this proof. If you believe this proof, for those of you who believe it, I'm going to pre prove that there exist infinitely many even prime numbers. <laughs> because I just sum, I just take the chance that any even number is a prime number, and that's something like one over that number. So the chances that uh, um, you have 1 over log 2n, with 2n are even numbers, and this is n over infinity, and this certainly is divergent. So this should be the number of even prime numbers. Um, that sounds kind of strange, right? Now, this sentence is completely wrong. <laughs> because the chance that 100 is a prime number is zero, because it isn't. Right? <laughs> the chance that 97 is a prime number is one, because it is a prime number. So the fact chance that something is a prime number is not a mathematical statement. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that seems the end of the idea. No, it's not the end of the idea. Because what you secretly do in all these problems, you think, well, let's suppose the Fermat numbers are kind of randomly chosen. It's not completely true because two Fermat prime numbers are relatively prime and they're all odd, so, well, there's more chance that they're prime than, 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 than the not prime usual sense. But let's suppose, or a little paper, or a little back room, let's suppose they're completely randomly <coughs> distributed. Then this proof makes sense. Right? And then you 
you see that this is okay. Okay, now I come to uh, perfect numbers. There's a theorem which is by Euclid and by Euler. It says that n even is perfect if and only if there exists in m such as this m is 2 to n minus 1 times 2 to n minus 1 and 2 to the m minus 1 prime. And remember, I had uh, 2 times 3. I had 3 as a perfect number and then did this. Then I had 4 times 7. And these are exactly numbers of the shape. Here you take m equal to 2. Here you take m equal to 3. So now this way is easy, and this way I leave it to an exercise, and it's not difficult. So all of a sudden, the way to decide whether there are many perfect numbers is to decide whether there are center primes, there are center numbers, which I perform two p minus 1 and prime. Now they're not all prime because you easily see that p is 11 and then you see that the 11 divides 2 to the 11 minus 1 uh, and 3 minus 1. So there are some primes which in exponent which don't work but what you can do chance that MP is prime yeah, and then you sum of your P right? and this is called M MP this of course is something like the sum over P and then I sum one of the logarithms and now I should write 2 to the P minus 1 but I a little bit sloppy and write 2 to the P right? and this is something like um, 1 over P sum and then uh, times 1 over log to 2 but now you remember that Euler proved that this is divergent right? so this is a divergent sequence so the conjecture is the infinitely many ascending numbers which are prime and the infinitely many perfect numbers. So although we only know 42 of them, right, we firmly believe that the perfect numbers, the number of perfect numbers, is infinite. Be careful. said if n is even and it's perfect, then it's of this form. But for odd perfect numbers, we have no such theorem. And we have no idea whether there exist odd perfect numbers. And let me tell you the expectation. The answer is no. Now what's the difference between the conjecture and expectation?